Was North America ever ruled by an empire, the same way that Europe was once ruled by the Greeks and the Romans? Surprisingly, the answer appears to be yes. And the evidence comes from an unexpected source. Who built this empire? Might it have been relatives of the Mayans or the Aztecs or other powerful peoples from Mesoamerica? The answer has remained a mystery until now. My name is Nathaniel Jensen, and I'm the research biologist with Answers in Genesis, and this is the lost history of North America. My goal is to recover the history of the lands I now call home and to restore to every school child in America the dignity of the people who came before and to build respect for the nations, the battles, the peoples, and the heroes of pre-Columbian North America so that children don't grow up like I did, ignorant of what came before and of who came before and neglectful of those who remain, but instead learn to revere the thousands of years of pre-Columbian North American history the same way that they learned to revere the history of Europe for thousands of years there. If you're watching this video and you're Native American, I'd ask you to stick with me to the end. I have a specific request for your help I'd like to share with you. And I trust this history, this, this video, will help restore back to you some of the history that's been taken away. About a thousand years ago, in the middle of North America, there once was a great city whose political control extended far and wide. How do we know this is true? Well, if you travel to modern St. Louis, you can still see the remains. Great mounds, the area that once was called Cahokia. At its height, the city was the largest north of the Rio Grande, at 3,000 to 16,000 people. Cahokia may seem small by modern standards compared to modern metropolises, but if we compare it to contemporary cities of its day, to places perhaps more familiar for Europeans like London, it gives us a different perspective. This is just a quote from Encyclopedia Britannica. They say in 1085 AD, London had between 10,000 and 15,000 inhabitants, which is less than 2% of England's population, but it was the largest city in Europe north of the Alps. So that covers the range of Cahokia. So 3,000 to 16,000 people is a big city for 1,000 AD. How do we know that this city, Cahokia, held sway far beyond the Mississippi? because their enemies said so. The Delawares, or I should say the algic speaking peoples of the time in the AD 1200s, so the ancestors would have included the ancestors of the Shawnees and the Mohicans and the Ojibwes and many other Algonquian tribes. These people fought a series of battles on the Great Plains. And because of these great battles and their desire to leave them, they were pushed into the arms of Cahokia on the Mississippi. The Delawares left us a document that records the events of this period called the Red Record of the Wallum Olam. Now, this document has been rejected as a forgery. A 1990s era thesis at Rutgers argued that this was the work of a Kentucky gentleman in the early 1800s for his own profit. However, I find his conclusions weak and find them contradicted by a variety of other lines of evidence. I've gone over this in previous videos. We'll give you the links in the description. In the, for the previous episodes where I walk you through the controversy and the evidence in favor of the Red Record being authentic, you can go to our Answers in Genesis YouTube channel, find the playlist, The Lost History of North America. I'm persuaded that this is an authentic document, so persuaded that I think it should be required reading for every high school student in the United States. As it relates to our discussion, the Delawares describe running into a group they call the Telegas, and they said these Telegas possessed the East, Again, in previous episodes, I walk through how the Red Record description of what's going on here at the Mississippi lines up point for point for what the archaeological record says was the history of the rise and fall of the greatest city north of the Rio Grande. Again, the description, the links in the description will, will take you to those places where I, where I describe that in more detail and justify this. So the question then becomes, who were the Telegas who possessed the East? Yes, they were the rulers of Cahokia. But who built this city? Who built this empire? And might these builders have had any connection to peoples of Mesoamerica who were much more well known for their empires, peoples like the Aztecs and before them, the Mayans? The Red Record says, the Red Record of the Delawares, that says after they defeated the people at Cahokia, the Telegas, the Telegas went south. 
not necessarily southwest to Mexico, but south. And archaeologically, after the fall of Cahokia, there arose in the century or two that followed in the area of now Alabama, maybe Mississippi, another mound building culture. Cahokia, of course, built great mounds. There were smaller ones at Moundville. So it suggests this was perhaps the area to which the Telegas fled. So let's begin our search there. At the time of contact, there were some fairly well-known tribes who existed in the southeastern United States. This is a map of the various Native American groups in North America at the time of contact, colored by language family. I'm going to highlight for us one of the main groups that might ring a bell for you in the southeastern United States, south of Cahokia. And this is the Muscogean language family. I'm going to change the map now so we can focus on this set of Indian tribes, linguistically related groups. The Chickasaw Choctaw might be more familiar to you. This map has the Muscogee as one of the groups. They're perhaps better known as the Creeks. Muscogean is the linguistic term for the larger language family that ties all these together. Did these peoples have any connection to the greatest city north of the Rio Grande? Did these peoples have any connection to Mesoamerica? With respect to the second question, the answer, once again, is yes. How do we know this is true? Because they said so. And before I show you what they said, I want to stop and make a point that if you haven't seen the previous episodes, this is where I describe the justification for why I'm so trusting of Native American counts. This is a different attitude than what the mainstream science has, which tends to start with the position that all these accounts are wrong or mythological or, or inauthentic, ahistorical, until archaeology proves otherwise. My experience with the Red Record, which has been so severely criticized that the Delaware Nation disowned it as their own, and of course it's turned out to be the opposite, it's, it's authentic based on multiple lines of evidence, including recent genetic discoveries. My attitude is now, I'm going to believe these accounts unless we have significant evidence to the contrary. But because there's controversy, I want to give you some of the backstory to these accounts so that you can give the fuller context and decide for yourself whether or not you're going to believe these accounts. So with respect to the Muscogians, I'm going to focus and, and begin our focus on what the Creeks themselves said. So their account of their history comes from a Frenchman named Louis Leclerc de Milford. And his account was written in 1802, called a memoir or a cursory glance at my different travels and my sojourn in the Creek Nation. All of these quotations. I'm going to have the full documentation at the bottom of the screen, the page numbers. You can look it up for yourself. So many of these are expired copyrights. You can find them online, read the entire book, and, and make your own decision. So de Milford says, so of course the title says he was among the Creeks, and he said, since my arrival among the Creeks, the old chiefs had often spoke to me of their ancestors and had shown me the strands of beads or a sort of chaplet in which their history was recorded. These chaplets represent their public records. They are made of little beads like those we call pearls de Cayenne. These beads are of diverse colors. I just used whatever spelling they used in 1802, and I'll do this in other quotes, and are strung one right after the other, their signification depending upon the arrangement and the form of the bead. So notice right away, this is not some guy just shooting from the hip and, and making up something on the spot. De Milford describes for us a system they had in place, the care they took to preserve their history, which I think is important when evaluating how much trust to put in it, and I think it's trustworthy. As only principal events without details are recorded in these strands, it sometimes happens that a single chaplet comprises the history of 20 to 25 years. These beads are ranged so as to define exactly the periods of time, and each year can be easily distinguished by those who understand the arrangement. As I was totally ignorant of it and was eager to learn the history of the people that had adopted me and whose interests were as dear to me as those of my own country, I begged the elders to relate it to me orally. I'm now going to relate as exactly as possible the narrative told me by this old man. And again, this is all backstory so that you get the context for what this guy is saying and what they did to preserve that history all the way up to 1802 where de Milford then put it in print. So the history of the Muscogians, Muscogee is now called Creeks. After the Spanish conquest of Mexico, so notice that right away, the, the time frame for this, this would be early 1500s. 
All the world knew that this beautiful land of North America was inhabited by a docile and peaceable people who, ignorant of firearms, were easily subjugated. They had only courage and numbers to oppose the deadly weapons of their enemies. In short, they were defenseless. For what availed bows and arrows against the artillery of an army, weak indeed in numbers, but inured to war, intrepid, and led on by an insatiable greed of gold, which this too trusting people had been unfortunate enough to parade before their eyes. Montezuma, you might recognize that name, Aztec ruler, then reigned in Mexico. Finding that he was unable to check the progress of the Spanish, he summoned to his aid the tribes contiguous to his domains. And here's where the Creeks come in. The Muscogee Nation, now known as Creeks, which formed a separate republic in the northwestern part of Mexico and had a formidable number of warriors. But before we read on, let's put this on a map. I'm a visual person. Perhaps you are too. This is an exaggerated topographical map. Today, northwest Mexico would be up there, which of course is very different, a very different location than where the Creeks were found at the time of English contact, way over here in the southeastern United States, what's now southeastern U.S., there's Northwest Mexico. I'll come back to how it might have been different than what I've shown on the screen here. So the separate republic, northwestern part of Mexico, had a formidable number of warriors, and the Creeks offered Montezuma assistance. An assistance that would have been redoubtable. I had to look that up. It just means impressive. It would have been impressive for any but a disciplined army such as that of the Spanish under Hernando Cortes. So the Aztec Empire at that time, 1519, covered coast to coast from the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific. Tenochtitlan was the capital, but they held sway over a number of the surrounding nations. So this makes me think then when the Creek gentleman says Northwest Mexico, yet Montezuma is asking for those who are contiguous to his domain to come and help. Perhaps Northwest wasn't that far north. If the Aztecs were down here, perhaps the Creeks were closer, still in a northwesterly direction, but up that way. And this would be 1521 then when the battles are fought. So they offered him assistance. It would have been helpful, except you have Cortes that they're opposing. The courage of this martial people only served to effect its speedier destruction and could not save Montezuma, who lost his life and his empire, which was almost totally depopulated. After the death of Montezuma and several other chiefs, the Muscogees, considerably weakened by this dreadful war, which they were no longer in a position to wage, chose to abandon a country, chose to abandon Mexico, that offered them in exchange for their past happiness only the most terrible slavery, the Spanish were trying to enslave them, and to seek another that would ensure them the ample resources and the peace and tranquility of which the Spanish had just despoiled them. Now, of course, we're going to see that they eventually end up in the southeastern United States, but I want you to see some of the detail that this guy gives, which to me is, again, an argument for its authenticity, that this much detail was preserved about their origins and migration. Not something he's making up on the spot or mythology. They directed their march northward, and within a fortnight had mounted as far as the headwaters of the Red River. Where is the Red River? Well, there's one in Minnesota. There's also one that forms the border of what's now Oklahoma and Texas. Right here, the headwaters extended to New Mexico. So he says they went north to those headwaters, so that would be up this way. And he says it was a distance about 100 leagues. Now, I'm going to give you a couple different distance descriptions as we read this account. I don't know that de Milford was that great with distances, because if you run the math, a league, according to Encyclopedia Britannica, is anywhere from two to almost five miles. So 100 leagues would be 240 to 460 miles, maybe 500 miles, which isn't that long if you draw a line from the headwaters and 500 miles or so south. It just barely gets you across the Texas-Mexico border, not close to the Aztecs. I don't know what to do with that, but I'll show you another example in a little bit where de Milford's reckoning of geographic distance seems to be a little off. I don't think that calls the account into question but it's something to consider. This river, the Red River, pours its waters across vast prairies in the northern part of America, a fact that decided them to follow its course. They marched for another week in this direction, traversing a prairie studded with the most beautiful flowers and swarming with wild animals which offer them everything necessary for their sustenance. And if you look at where prairies are, yes, there's the Great Plains in the Midwest, but there is prairie that extends down here into northern Texas, just south of the Red River border. So that fits. They're migrating now eastward. This region would have attracted them in view of its varied riches, but still fearing for their safety. In other words, trying to escape the Spanish. 
In a region that offered them no natural defenses, they continued their journey. In their different excursions along this river, they never came across another stream, not even a small tributary. And I think it's the translators or the editors, perhaps, to make a note saying most of the tributaries or affluents of the Red River enter from the north side. So if they're not finding tributaries, they must be on the south side, the Texas side of the Red River. They found many lakes and ponds, some of them with salt water. These were usually teeming with waterfowl of every kind, in particular those birds found in the seaboard. The prairies were alive with partridges, hares, rabbits, turkeys, and other wildlife. In these regions, the game was so abundant that when it is hunted from different points at the same time and is forced to flee, it darkens the sky and shades all the ground. After marching for several days, so let me pause here and say if they talked about moving for a fortnight, that the total time of travel that they've spent here is about three weeks and several days. After marching for several days, they came to some clumps of trees where they made a halt. Young warriors were sent out in different directions by the elders to explore the territory. At the end of a month, so now we're up to about two months of travel from Mexico, they returned to report that they had discovered some fine subterranean dwellings along the Red River on the fringe of a forest. So this is now a transition from the ecological zone from prairie to forest. The Red River does leave Oklahoma and Texas and enter southwestern Arkansas, northwestern Louisiana. And if you look at maps of where forest exists, or if you live in these regions, East Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, there's forest there, all that fits. So they're continuing eastward. The entire nation set off at once, and when they arrived at these caverns, they found that they had been made by bison, or wild steers or other animals, which had occupied them because the earth there was a little salty. The Muscogees found in this region a tranquility of which they had need in order to retrieve the heavy losses suffered in the Mexican wars. The colony, having brought along its little remaining stock of maize, planted it at once to assure a means of sustenance. So notice that they have no problem setting up shop after a significant travel and planting roots, essentially. As they lacked the necessary implements for working the ground, they used sharp flint stones instead of hatchets to cut and sharpen sticks of wood, which they then hardened in the fire and used for tilling the soil. After this preliminary work in their new settlement, they marked off a field large enough to supply the general needs of the colony and fenced it round with stumps and stakes driven into the ground to prevent incursions by bison and other wild animals, which are very fond of Indian corn. Again, notice the amount of specific detail that's present in this account and notice how easy it is for them to move and then stop because this is a point we're going to come back to when we talk about some of the criticisms of this account. They next parceled out by families the ground in this enclosure and sowed it for their sustenance. The young people of both sexes toiled together in the field, whilst the old men smoked their pipes. They thus passed several years in perfect peace. So the total time then, travel, and then the residence. So it was about two months of travel, now it's several years. So we're probably talking perhaps late 1520s, where they're here in Arkansas, Louisiana, East Texas. Living by hunting, fishing, and from the produce of their land, regretting little, their native country, where they had suffered such adversities. They would no doubt have remained here permanently if the unfortunate fate that seemed to dog their steps had not compelled them to migrate again. They were discovered by the Alabamus, I think these are the Alabamas, who killed several of their people. And if that's true, these would have been linguistic relatives. That raises the question, of course, if the Alabamas had migrated first, or what exactly the relationship was between the two. But the point for our purposes is they were prompted to migrate again because they have to deal with enemies. So the elders, the natural chiefs of the nation, called together the young warriors and sent them on the trail of the assassins, but without success, because there was no coordination in their operations and they lacked a chieftain. Now I'm going to switch to one of their linguistic relatives, stop the Creek account here, or pause it, and for reasons I don't have time to get into, I think what the Creeks describe what the Chickasaw accounts describe and what the Choctaw accounts describe are the same migration. The Chickasaw tell us about how many people came and they, at, and one of the two, or both of them talk about crossing the Mississippi as well. So this is from a 1775 document by James Adair, History of the American Indians. Their Chickasaw tradition says that their camp consisted of 10,000 men, besides women and children, when they came from the west and passed over the Mississippi. So I had left the creeks right here. Mississippi is right here, so it would fit. They're having to leave the Alabamas. They're fleeing. They cross the Mississippi. Now, the timing of the Chickasaw account seems to be contemporary with what we just described because 
Adair says the fine breed of running wood horses they brought with them were the present Mexican or Spanish barbs, which they're not going to have until the Spanish arrive. So it would seem like they're probably migrating with the Creeks, leaving Mexico. Now, what about the Choctaw? From an 1884 document by Gatchet, a migration legend of the Creek Indians, and he talks about other, <laughs> other accounts. The Choctaw trace their, he calls it, mythic origin from the stooping, leaning, or winding hill. Forgive me if I mispronounce this. The Nani Waya, a mound of 50 feet altitude, situated in Winston County, Mississippi, on the headwaters of the Pearl River, which, of course, at the time of contact, the Choctaw were found in Mississippi heavily. The top of this birthplace of the nation is level and has a surface of about one fourth of an acre. One legend states that the Choctaw arrived there after crossing the Mississippi and separated from the Chickasaw, who, were, who went north during an epidemic. So combining these accounts together, a minimum of 10,000, or if 10,000 was just the Chickasaw number, it could have been even greater. And remember, the Creeks talk about they brought with them crops. They were able to set up a camp, fence in an area, live there for several years. This people group seems to have no problem pulling up roots, planting them again, pulling up and planting them again. They crossed the Mississippi, it appears, within a few years, perhaps late 1520s after leaving Mexico, and then eventually disperse. And we can bookend, I think, the end of the time of their travel, because another conquistador, de Soto, entered North America via Florida, migrated through the southeastern United States. The exact route is still a matter of debate among scholars, but either he or one of his men kept a journal and talked about the people they encountered in one of them, and you may not be able to read this on your screen, but the Chickasaw was one of the peoples they encountered in, in this location right here. Mississippi, basically, is where the Chickasaw were found in maps of, of their locations at the time of contact. So, given the date for DeSoto, it appears they were settled within a few decades of having left Mexico. Now, this is one of the criticisms of this account. How is it possible that this people could flee Mexico and be resident in the southeastern United States looking as if they had been there comfortably for a while when DeSoto shows up? That's just too short. And it's a criticism worth thinking about. I'm comfortable given their descriptions of how quickly they made this journey and what they say about what they brought with them, that I don't think they have any problem traversing this distance, crossing the Mississippi, eventually landing here and setting up a civilization by the 1540s. Now, none of this connects us to Cahokia. It does tell us that the Muscogians, that Chickasaw, Choctaw, and Creeks arrived recently from northern Mexico, and just to emphasize this point, 1521, 1540s, this is several centuries too late for the rise and fall of Cahokia. Cahokia, the, what's called the Big Bang of Cahokia, it's, it's time of great fluorescence before its decline, was from the thousands AD to the 1200s, and Cahokia falls permanently in the late 1200s, several centuries before the 1500s. So why would we even talk about this? The fact that Muscogians say they came from Mexico opens up a whole new world of possibilities for identifying the builders of this great city, Cahokia, north of the Rio Grande. So they came from Mexico, but it appears to be late. Are there any other peoples south of Cahokia who could be candidates for building this great city? Maps like this one that show the locations of tribes at the time of contact tend not to give the Natchez or Natchi much space. In fact, you might have a hard time seeing it here. I've tried to highlight it on the map in blue. But the Natchez's own history reveals a much, much bigger role, historical role, than this picture implies. So to, to zoom in here and put them closer to this other map, on the map next to the Muscogians, they don't look like much at the time of contact, but their history contains some remarkable insights to where they came from and what they were doing. Did the Natchez connect to Mesoamerica like the Muscogians? The answer is yes, and the answer is yes not once, but twice. Once again, 
from going to the native accounts, which my default position is they're accurate unless you have compelling reason to think otherwise. And I say, I've even been told by natives saying there's some accounts you have to be careful of. For example, I forget the guy's name, but he would go around to some of the tribes and would give the children candy saying, you know, could you please tell me your history? And the kids would make up stuff just to get candy. So I've, I've already been cautioned by some native people saying, beware of this guy or this guy. I understand that there are some cases where caution is warranted, but I, I take again the opposite position of mainstream science, which is I'm going to start with the position of let's hear it. And if there are things that sound way off or give us reason to pause, fine. We might have some skepticism, but let's hear it out. I think it's likely true. So once again, the backstory, this is, a, this is by LePage de Pratt's 1774. His book is called The History of Louisiana or of the Western Parts of Virginia and Carolina. And of course, at the time of contact, the Natchez were in Louisiana. So 1700s, and, and keep that date in mind, because we're going to come back to that in a minute to try to understand what he's describing and the words he's using, because the historical context matters. So de Pratt says, the remarkable difference I observed between the Natchez, including in that name, the nations whom they treat as brethren, and the other people of Louisiana, made me extremely desirous to know whence both of them might originally come. I therefore applied myself one day to put the keeper of the temple in good humor, and having succeeded in that without much difficulty, I then told him that from the little resemblance I observed between the Natchez and the neighboring nations, I was inclined to believe that they were not originally of the country which they then inhabited, and that if the ancient speech taught him anything on that subject, he would do me a great pleasure to inform me of it. At these words, the Natchez keeper of the temple leaned his head on his two hands, with which he covered his eyes, and having remained in that posture for about a quarter of an hour, as if to recollect himself, he answered to the following effect, so there's the context. Again, it doesn't strike me as an account that they make up on the spot. He's taking care to remember what his ancestors had said. And what you'll see is, again, a tremendous amount of specific detail. So to, to give you the, the contrary view, I have read some accounts where the description is extremely vague. The numbers used are rounded numbers. The author himself speaks very hesitatingly, saying, well, maybe this happened or that happened. Those to me are hints that the guy who's telling the account isn't sure of himself or sure that what he's saying is accurate. This doesn't read that way. You don't have to believe me. You can, you can judge for yourself. Here we go. So the keeper of the temple said, before we came into this land, we lived yonder under the sun. This phrase, under the sun, is going to be even more significant in a minute when we get to a later quote where there's some ambiguity. So notice this first use here. Yonder, under the sun, pointing with his finger nearly southwest, by which I understood that he meant Mexico. What is Mexico? Modern Mexico? 1774 is the context. The United States is about to become, well, the 13 colonies are about to become the United States. And what is now Texas, California, Mexico belongs to the Spaniards. This is a map from 1810. But I use this map because there's still significant chunks that are now the United States, but were part of New Spain. And it raises the question of when he said Mexico, is that modern Mexico or does that include parts of Texas? And you'll see why this is relevant in a minute. We lived in a fine country where the earth is always pleasant, which of course the climate Mexico is, is much warmer. There are sons, so they don't call them sachems, sachems apparently, or chieftains. It's sons is the term for their leaders. And you can see this in the context. Again, you can look up the whole book yourself if you like. Had their abode and our nation maintained itself for a long time against the ancients of the country. We'll figure out from the context in a few minutes who these ancients were. The ancients conquered some of their villages in the plains, but never could force us from the mountains. So there's some geographic clues, plains and mountains. If you look at this, again, exaggerated topographical map of Mexico, plenty of hill country mountains here. And plains likely put you along the coast or maybe in Texas. Our nation extended itself along the great water where this large river loses itself. I have to work backwards here in this quote because there's a few steps to figure out what this great water is. Remember, this book is about Louisiana. So the large river is going to be the Mississippi River. Where does the Mississippi River lose itself? Of course, the Mississippi River starts in Minnesota, comes down this way, loses itself in the Gulf of Mexico. 
We're talking about the Natchez here. So the large river, the Mississippi, loses itself in the Gulf of Mexico. So the great water must be the Gulf of Mexico. The nation extended itself along the Gulf of Mexico. We just mentioned that there were plains and hills. So maybe here along the western coast of the Gulf of Mexico. As our enemies were become very numerous and very wicked, our sons sent some of their subjects who lived near this river. So let's stop the quote again to put this on the map. This river is again apparently the Mississippi. So it seems that wherever part of the nation lived, there was another part that may have lived close to the Mississippi, along the Gulf Coast, perhaps up this way. So the sons sent some of the subjects who lived near this river to examine whether we could retire into the country through which it flowed. So north then. The country on the east side of the Mississippi River, being found extremely pleasant, the great son, upon the return of those who had examined it, ordered all his subjects who lived in the plains and who still defended themselves against the ancients. Remember that he just said the plains is where they struggled against the ancients. If they were in the mountains, they were able to fight off or be protected against the ancients. So he ordered these people on the plains to remove into this land east of the Mississippi, here to build a temple and to preserve the eternal fire. A great part of our nation accordingly settled here. Not all of them, but a great part, where they lived in peace and abundance for several generations. So, if this is the area, and perhaps even extending into Louisiana, along the Gulf Coast, where the people originally were, roughly, he sent a big group east of the Mississippi, somewhere. And, and I try not to draw sharp borders because this isn't... Uh, GIS precise information. It's general locations, regions. The great son and those who had remained with him. So again, there's still a group that stays back in Mexico or along the Gulf Coast. Never thought of joining us. Being tempted to continue where they were by the pleasantness of the country, which was very warm, an accurate description of Mexico, and by the weakness of their enemies. So the enemies, the ancients who had been oppressing them, then fell into civil dissensions in consequence of the ambition of one of the, their chiefs, one of the chiefs of the ancient enemies, who wanted to raise himself from a state of equality with the other chiefs of the villages and to treat all the people of his nation as slaves. During those discords among our enemies, some of them even entered into an alliance with the great son, the great son of the Natchez, who still remained in our old country, that he might conveniently assist our other brethren who had settled on the banks of the great water to the east of the large rivers. The great water is the gulf. But now we're talking east of the Mississippi. And notice this. And extended themselves so far on the coast and among the isles that the great sun did not hear of them sometimes for five or six years together. The isles. So they're so far along the coast. We said some were sent east of the Mississippi. They expanded. This is the great waters. And they extended to the isles. Florida Keys are islands. Did they even extend into the Caribbean? Very intriguing question. And I'm going to stop here and label this the first migration because we're going to soon see there was a second migration. There's still people back here in Mexico, but there's a group that's sent out this way, east of the Mississippi, and they flourish and expand. And apparently for a long time, it was not till after many generations. So a long time passes. The great sons, plural, came and joined us in this country, apparently east of the Mississippi or Louisiana. Where from the fine climate and the peace we had enjoyed, we had multiplied like the leaves of the trees. So they were a great number. Wide geographic area, large in number. And why did the great sons leave Mexico, where the climate was so nice? Because warriors of fire, who made the earth to tremble, had arrived in our old country, having entered into an alliance with our brethren. So stop for a minute. These invaders, warriors of fire, their identity will become clear in a minute, ally themselves with the Natchez and conquer the ancient enemies. This will give us some clues now to who these ancient enemies are. But attempting afterwards to make slaves of our sons, so the warriors of fire ally themselves with the Natchez, they conquer the ancient enemies of the Natchez, and then the warriors of fire try to enslave the Natchez, and their sons in particular. The sons, rather than submit to them, left our brethren who refused to follow them. So, so apparently there's still a group of Natchez back in Mexico at this time. And the sons, with their slaves, came hither to Louisiana. That's the second migration. So de Pratt says, upon my asking him, the keeper of the temple, who those warriors of fire were, he replied that they were bearded white men, somewhat of a brownish color, who carried arms that darted out fire with great noise, guns, 
and killed at a great distance, which is what guns do, that they had likewise heavy arms, which killed a great many men at once, cannons, and like thunder made the earth tremble, and that they came from the sun rising in floating villages. They came from the east in boats. Very picturesque descriptions. The ancients of the country, he said, were very numerous. Large population at the time of the arrival of these warriors of fire. And inhabited, and this is where it gets a bit ambiguous, a bit ambiguous from the western coast of the Great Water. That seems to be pretty clear. That's the eastern coast of Mexico, the western coast of the Gulf of Mexico. To the northern countries, so go north from there is what it seems to be saying, on his side the sun. And that's how it reads in the original document. What does on his side the sun mean? I'm not sure. And very par far upon the same coast beyond the sun. Now, I tend to think beyond the sun would seem to be west. So, but, but what's the same coast that goes west? This is where I, I can't quite figure out what this text means. From everything else he says, it sounds like he's describing the Aztecs, or whoever was the long-standing people in Mesoamerica, who kept oppressing the Natchez, caused them to flee initially, then fought amongst themselves. One guy tried to exalt himself. They eventually overthrown by Cortes, the Spaniards, in alliance with some of the peoples of that area. So the Aztec domain extended from the western coast of the Gulf of Mexico or the eastern coast of Mexico all the way to the Pacific. So that would be west. But how to make sense of what he's saying north and res with respect to the sun, I'm not sure. My best guess is he's describing Aztecs and whoever's under their domain. Cortez lands on the western coast of the Gulf of Mexico, which is again where we had put the Natchez originally. And we know from historical accounts, Cortez allied himself with other Native American peoples in the area. And it was because of their help that he was able to defeat the Aztecs. So the Natchez appear to be one of those groups that Cortez brings into his army, travels westward, conquers the capital of the Aztecs, Tenochtitlan, and then apparently tries to make slaves of the Natchez as well. They say, no, thank you, we're getting out of here. The Natchez continue to describe, this keeper describes these ancients saying they had a great number of large and small villages, which were all built of stone. And let me pause and say, the, the current, I'd say, thinking as to how many people were in Mesoamerica at the time of conquest was a huge amount. So this guy's description of these people being very numerous fits that as well. He also says they had large and small villages which were all built of stone in which there were houses large enough to lodge a whole village. Their temples were built with great labor and art. They made beautiful works of all kinds of materials. Which, if you've seen, All this that he's describing, if you've seen reconstructions of Tenochtitlan, the capital city of the Aztecs, that seems to be what he's describing. Now, just to put this back on the map then. So there's, there's an initial migration to the east of the Mississippi and along the eastern coast of the Gulf of Mexico and to Florida, apparently, perhaps even to the islands. Many generations pass, and then there's a second migration because the great sons who initially helped Cortez said, we're getting out of here. So the Aztecs are down here. 1521, Cortez fights them. And the Natchez, who were allied with Cortez after that victory over the Aztecs, say we're leaving. Their second migration, they come and join those who are over here. That still doesn't connect us to Cahokia. It gives us a second group that came from Mexico. And in two waves, it does give us a group of people that did spread far and wide in the east. And the Delawares, when they come to the Mississippi and encounter the Telegas, describe the Telegas as having ruled the east. That's as, far, as much as I've told you so far. Did the Natchez form an empire? That's the question. Was North America ever ruled by an empire? De Pratz says in his book that the Natchez, the Grigras, the Theo, and I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, forgive me, may together raise about 1,200 warriors. And that's in 1774, several centuries, a couple centuries after the fleeing from Mexico the second time, and perhaps even longer from the first migration. So he says, at that time, they could raise about 1,200 warriors, which is but a small force in comparison of what the Natchez could formerly have raised alone. 
for according to their traditions, they were the most powerful nation in, of all North America. And you might say, ah, everyone says they're the most powerful nation. Not true. The Delaware don't describe themselves as the most powerful nation. They talk about battles that they lost. And in fact, they go and encounter the Cahokians because they're, I think, tired of fighting whoever they were fighting on the plains. And they initially try to cross. The Cahokians say no and defeat them. And it takes a couple sachems before they finally defeat the Talegas and send them south. So I don't think we should just dismiss this out of hand. They were the most powerful nation, the Natchez of all of North America, were looked upon by other nations as their superiors and on that account respected by them. And here's where it gets even more interesting. To give an idea of their power, I shall only mention that formerly they extended from the river Manchac or Iberville, which is about 50 leagues from the sea. 50 leagues, again using the Britannica conversion factors, is about 80 miles, excuse me, 50 leagues would be about 120 to 230 miles. Iberville is more like 80 miles. So again, his geography seems to be off in this case. So earlier he seemed to be underestimating distance. Now he seems to be overestimating distance. To the river Wabash, I'm going to put this on a map here in a minute, which is distant from the sea about 460 leagues, which if you use the Encyclopedia Britannica conversion, is going to be anywhere from 1,100 to two, over 2,000 miles. And the actual distance is about only 800 or less. So again, I, I don't know what to make of de Pratt's geographic distance calculations, but he gives us these specific locations, Iberville and Wabash, we can put on the map. Iberville is down here. And, and this is, again, to, to point out that the quote I, I give you doesn't mention the fact that they had expanded along the eastern coast of the Great Water, even down to the Isles, perhaps the Florida Keys. What we're trying to figure out now is how far north they went. He said they were from Iberville all the way up to the Wabash, which this river right here forms part of the border between Illinois and Indiana, and the headwaters are up this way. So they once extended all the way that way. And they had about 500 sons or princes, which if you're going to rule that distance, surely you need that many administrators and, and rulers. Where is Cahokia? Cahokia is where modern St. Louis is, which is well within the domain of what de Pratt says was formerly the area in which they had 500 princes. John Haywood, 1823, The Natural and Aboriginal History of Tennessee, describes the Natchez. It's, I don't know if he's just quoting from de Pratt's or what his sources are, but he, he adds something to this that I think is interesting. All those nations which lived on the west side of the Mississippi when they first became known to Europeans between the years 1682 and 1697 were worshippers of the sun, which, if I'm not mistaken, is what the Natchez were, were governed by despotic princes, which makes you wonder if the Natchez rule extended west of the Mississippi as well. The Natchez at this time extended from, and, and this is what we just read from de Pratt's, basically verbatim, but Haywood adds, it is probable that they extended laterally up all the rivers which fall into Mississippi between the two extremes, the extremes of Iberville and the Wabash. The and talks about the mounds, 500 sachems, this is a drainage, a map of the drainage basin of the Mississippi. So the Tennessee River, the Ohio River, these, these drain of the Mississippi as well. Could that have been the entirety of the Natchez domain? The Delawares say they came to the Talegas, which seems to be the site of, it fits again, what the, what the Red Record says fits the archaeological description of Cahokia. So I can, I'm going to say, I think with confidence, the Delawares came to Cahokia the Talegas, whoever they are, ruled the East, possessed the East. The Natchez description of what they once ruled seems to be the East. And to add one more line of evidence to this, go back to archaeology. There's a cultural phenomenon called the Mississippian culture, which seems to originate at Cahokia. I've redrawn a map from an archaeological textbook, Recent Developments in Southeastern Archaeology 2012 by Anderson and Sassman. Figure 5.2 that I've redrawn here shows the spread of chieftains, chiefdoms, I should say. 8900, located to Cahokia and in the location further south. But these chiefdoms expand with time and cover a significant section of the southeastern 
the United States and seem to overlap a good chunk of the area where the Natchez say they were. So if you put all these pieces together and look at the correlations, the Natchez say they once were east of the Mississippi, down into the Florida, the Florida Keys, many generations prior to the 1521 migration. Put what they say together with what the Delaware say, with what archaeology says, and I would argue that the Natchez are the best candidate for being the rulers of Cahokia, and given what archaeology says and what they themselves say, Cahokia appears to have been the seat of a much larger empire. So the Natchez, who were of Mexican descent, were once the rulers of Cahokia. This raises many other questions. How many other North American peoples could have had connections to Mexico? This is, this is an area I, I wouldn't have even considered thinking about. I wouldn't have even asked this question before. I, was, I, I grew up thinking Mexico, Mesoamerica, just somehow disconnected from North America. Yet the peoples themselves say we came from there. And even if we just focus solely on the Natchez and the Muscogians, the Creeks and the Choctaws and the Chickasaws, what I haven't told you is what they were doing there for centuries before they migrated into the Southeast. To answer these questions, I've got a Native American history project. So if you're of Native American, if you're a Native American, I should say, we've already got a group of folks who have indicated their willingness to join this project. I've got contacts in about 20 different Native American nations. This project is ongoing. And the goal is to recover as much as possible about this pre-Columbian history combining what the natives themselves say, the indigenous histories, with linguistic clues and archaeological clues and genetic clues, which I've gone into more detail in previous episodes. And the three main arms of this project right now, if you're interested in helping, and I'll tell you how you can contact me in a minute, is number one, to collect as many more indigenous histories as possible. This is a huge neglected area, in a sense an area that I think mainstream science is basically taken away from the Native American community. This research gives it back. And we're going to have more videos coming out in this series. And you can, again, find them, keep up with the playlist, subscribe to Answers in Genesis YouTube channel. We'll have more videos, and I'll tell you about the next one here in a minute. Where I'm getting a little stuck at this point is with the Iroquoian or Cherokee history, and especially on the western coast of the U.S. and Canada. So especially if you're in those nations, I would love to know what you say your history is, because I think there's, there's history to be gleaned, and then when you start comparing the histories to one another, they talk about one another. And we can, we can date this event because this group over here has a date and talks about these people over here, and, and the history emerges in ways that blow my mind. I, I forget what I mentioned, but we're, actually, we're up to about 30 different nations now where we have contacts, which is fantastic. The second arm of this project is we're looking to find about 100 Native American men who are willing to participate in genetic testing. And this, again, any, so, so to clarify, we're looking for any North American Native American nation who has indigenous histories. I would love to know it so we can synthesize this and reconstruct the history. We're also looking for Native American men from any North American nation. This will eventually go into Latin America as well, hopefully, in the future. And for reasons I don't have time to get into, we're focusing on the male inherited DNA, the Y chromosome. This is a finicky test. It's not a test of are you Native American or not. It is a record very uh, of a very narrow part of a family tree, the strictly unbroken line of paternal descent, who your dad was and his dad and his dad and his dad all the way back. So you can have Native Americans all over your family tree. And if there's one generation where there's a father-daughter link instead of a father-son link, it throws off the Y chromosome. It's, it's a finicky test. So that's why I'm saying if you're a Native American male and you know you have Native Americans strictly going back, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, then you'd be a good candidate for this. I've got a verbal agreement with, a, with the retired CEO of Family Tree DNA where we can do this privately in the sense of I'm the only one who's going to have the personal information. The big company doesn't get it. They send test kits to me. I distribute the kits, get the informed consent, handle the ethical side, and send 
the kits with numbers back to the company, not with names and addresses and such. And then I download the data, go back to go back to you. So I think we've got a method in place to keep your information private. That's only one aspect of this genetic study, though. So I mentioned we're going to handle the ethical side. We're going to have an institutional review board that's going to oversee what we're doing. We're going to have input from Native American communities. But before we're actually going to do this, we're going to need permission from each of the participating nations. Many nations, I'm just going to assume all of them, have their own ethical review boards. And my thought is, if I just go in there and say, I'd like to work with your nation, they're going to say, who are you and what do you want? Go away. But if there's a large group of men or women who are Native Americans saying, we want to know our history, the chance of getting approval for this project, I think, goes up. So if you're a man, woman, and Native American, and you're interested in just being an advocate, would love to contact you as well. So for each of these three arms, the way to get in touch with me directly is to go to ancestorsandgenesis.org, which is our homepage, slash go, slash traced. Trace is the name of the book I published. That's the basis for a lot of this going back about uh, to 20, spring of 2022. This will be the look of the page when you go there you can either scroll down or just click this link it'll take you to a spot where you can enter your name email phone number this goes directly to my inbox re reply directly to you i've had now i've had a number of folks who contact me sharing their history and i don't know if my reply goes to spam or what so maybe check your junk mail if you could try to contact me i might just call you directly from my cell which will be a boston number because that's where i lived for six years and just retain my number Again, this, this is to get in touch with me directly if you want to participate. And, and, and contact me doesn't commit you to anything. If you just have questions, you want to feel this out, contact me. There, there's no obligation to anything. And there's no cost. We're covering the cost of, of the testing and such. And the long-term goal, again, is to, to recover this history and have every school child learn it so that they learn to respect what came prior instead of growing up in ignorance like I did. Next time, if you join us, we're going to deal with the question of what if the pilgrims had landed in Massachusetts, not in 1620, but several centuries earlier? Who would have hailed them on the shores of Cape Cod? And if your answer is the Narragansett or the Massachusetts or one of the many Algonquin tribes, that's this color right here, who were the residents of the East Coast at the time of contact, if that's your answer as to who the pilgrims would have encountered several centuries prior, that answer would be wrong. In AD 1000, the residents of the East Coast, of Washington, D.C., what's now Washington, D.C., were not Europeans, of course. They were not Algonquins, but they were somebody else. And the identity of these people has been a mystery until now. And to find out who they were, join us next time. Again, subscribe to Answers in Genesis on YouTube. Make sure you keep track of the playlist. This is where the episodes are posted, Lost History of North America. You can also get in touch with me on social media. This is where I post announcements when we, when we post a new video, have a new update, a new research discovery. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. I don't know how long I'll be allowed to be on there, so I've set up accounts in many, many other platforms as well. This is a place to ask me questions. And, and if you don't, don't want to go through the, the answers in genesis.org slash go slash trace in, in email contact, we can correspond this way as well. That's part of the reason I set up these accounts is so that I, I could speak to people directly. If you want to know more about what we're doing and the research that's behind it, I did publish a book last year, 2000, in, in spring of 2020, called Traced Human DNA's Big Surprise. This looks at the global history of humanity based on DNA, and there are a lot of surprises that, that have appeared revolutionary stuff. We did a, a playlist for this as well, about 16, 17 episodes. You can go to our Answers in Genesis YouTube page. This is the title of that playlist. And this research was also based on earlier research going back to 2020. We did about a 25-part series there, New History of the Human Race. Again, Answers in Genesis YouTube page. Find the playlists tab. This is the title of that playlist. You can find the videos there. Going back to 2017, one of the first books I wrote was called Replacing Darwin. This research, I've already talked about how it disagrees with mainstream science as it relates to the attitude towards Native American histories. This is based on revolutionary findings that also contradict the mainstream account on how you understand species and the timescale of human origins. I walk through the science of this 
in this book came out in 2017 it does get a little bit into the genetic weeds so if you want the cliff notes version replacing darwin made simple or if you want to watch a video that summarizes it i've got a one-hour lecture replacing darwin you can get in dvd form or you can subscribe to our uh our streaming platform answers.tv where you can find that video and a whole lot more tremendous resource tremendous alternative uh, to National Geographic and others, all sorts of content. We are also the, we're a nonprofit, I should add, not with the government. And we have our, we have a, we're the ones who have the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter, full-scale replica of Noah's Ark here in Northern Kentucky, close to Cincinnati, just across the river from them. Come visit us. This again is the lost history of North America. It's been a pleasure to do this research, to find all these surprises. Join us again next time for more of this lost history. I look forward to seeing you then.